I welcome folks who are signing in now to um, this webinar. I'm just going to give it maybe 30 more seconds to um, as people are are uh, coming in from um, the waiting room. I see our, our numbers are still going up here. So I'm just going to pause for another 30 seconds and then I will um, introduce today's program. And myself, I will introduce myself as well. People are probably wondering who the heck I am. All right, I think our, our numbers have stabilized at least for the moment. My name is Tamara Bennett Shelton. I'm really delighted to welcome you all here today uh, for the first in a series of talks on environmental justice. I'm coming to you as one of the co-PIs for a five college program called EnviroLab Asia, which is co-sponsoring these talks along with uh, Claremont McKenna's Presidential Initiative on Anti-Racism. Uh, I teach in the history department at Claremont McKenna and I've been involved with EnviroLab Asia since its inception in 2015. We are a Henry Luce Foundation funded five college program to support uh, research and curricular innovation at the intersection of Asian studies and environmental studies. Uh, we've been really lucky to work with a great set of five college faculty, students, and staff uh, to promote understanding um, this really vital part of the world and environmental issues as they unfold there. I would be thrilled if you had a chance to check out our website. You can learn more about our many different research projects and also about our upcoming talks in the series. We have several very interesting talks on environmental justice um, upcoming in the next month, and you can find information uh, about that uh, there on the website. For today, though, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Natalia Duong, who will introduce our speaker um, and also moderate the Q&A. So go ahead as, uh, and put your questions in the Q&A. We'll have some time at the end um, for our speaker to answer them. Thanks so much, Natalia. Thanks, Tamara, for that introduction. Um, and also a huge thanks to Rebecca Heeb for helping to organize this event as well as to the co-investigators with EnviroLab Asia for um, providing this opportunity to invite Dr. Jeannie Shinozuka. So before introducing us to today's speaker um, and ceding this ground to her, I wanted to just address um, two things. First, Jeannie and I uh, were trying to consider the role of land acknowledgement in online spaces and how we believe it's important to recognize that our work benefits from unceded and occupied land on which we both work and reside. And so I'm currently zooming in from unceded Weechin Ohlone land, what settlers now called Oakland, California. Um, and I want to recognize that decolonization is an ongoing process. And as such, I invite you to research the native land from which you are joining us um, as well. In addition, I want to recognize that the Claremont Colleges, including Pomona College, um, is settled on shared unceded land of the Tongva, Serrano, and Kahula peoples, many of whom continue to steward the land, their ancestral home. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Tongva people. And so I want to recognize that every member of the Five Seas community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding. And I want to also recognize that this statement of territory acknowledgement can only serve as partial restitution in an ongoing decolonial process, which must make broader measures to understand and reconcile with the colonial history of this land. Um, and so as we continue to think through um, envi the environment and our relationship to land and water with Dr. Shinozuka's talk today, I encourage us to continue to investigate our own relationship to the land as well. Second, Jeannie and I talked briefly, and we just wanted to hold space for recognizing the ways that the themes of her talk will help us to historicize the ongoing ways in which militarization and global racial capitalism continue to reverberate today, including the most recent killing of eight people, six of whom were women of Asian descent in Atlanta just a week ago. So my intention today was to read the victims' names. However, I want to respect recent discussion from the victim's loved ones and family members to not quote unquote speak their names in this fashion. So instead, I'll invite us to continue to honor their memory and also recognize how this incident 
is not an isolated event, but rather the culmination of ongoing overlapping injustices. So with that said, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Dr. Jeannie Shinazuka. Jeannie teaches in international studies at Soka University of America in Aliso Viejo, California. Her book project, whose title has recently changed since our flyers circulated, as the ambulance rolls by on my street, apologies. Her book project is now titled Biotic Borders, Trans-Pacific Plant and Insect Migration and the Rise of Anti-Asian Racism in America, 1890 to 1950, forthcoming with the University of Chicago Press. Her book argues that a constellation of American responses to Japanese plant, insect, and human immigrants beginning in the late 19th century constitute a historical instance of the centrality of biology and biota to race making and racial meanings. She has received funding from the Huntington Library, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and the D. Kim Foundation for History of Technology and Science in East Asia. Finally, um, I just want to remind attendees that a transcript is available if you would like captions, then please do push the button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, welcome Jeannie. Thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction, um, Dr. DeWong. I appreciate that. And I am excited to um, be here today um, to be able to talk about my forthcoming um, book project. So my larger book project charts the production of race and species over half a century in the human and more than human worlds, focusing on Japanese plant, insect, and human immigrants across the Pacific. Situating plants and insects as important actors in the histories of the US empire and a hemispheric context enables the recentering of more than human worlds that have enriched understandings of trans-Pacific racisms in Philadelphia, Washington, DC, Hawaii, and Latin America. United States Department of Agriculture officials targeted Japanese plant and insect immigrants for fear of chestnut blight, citrus canker, San Jose scale, the Japanese beetle and other invasions. The emergence of what I call biological nativism, a belief in the need to protect the nation's natural biosphere from foreign plants, insects, and peoples turned on the erasure of the American empire, the establishment of biotic borders, and the regulation of plant, insect, and human immigrants. With its unique geographical position in the Pacific Ocean and a gateway between the United States and Asia, Hawaii serves as a central arena to consider the processes of racial formations, since it has historically served as a laboratory to understand diseases such as Asiatic cholera and beriberi, as well as native ecologies. In the Northeast, where Japanese Americans did not reside in large numbers, Philadelphians welcomed and enjoyed the diversity that Japanese plant immigrants contributed to their daily landscapes. Hawaii and Philadelphia depended on sugar and ornamentals respectively and issued powerful responses to foreign invasives. To foreign invasives. Uh, so plant and immigrant human Im regulation set the stage for restriction for the restriction of what health and agricultural officers viewed as the new contagious yellow peril, Asians in Hawaii. For, Asian, for American scientists and policymakers, the movement of plants, food, and bodies from Asia and the insects and diseases that came with them threatened the biota that they deemed native. These trans-Pacific crossings helped fuel the emergence of biological nativism in the late 19th century. Proponents of biological nativism then sought to defend American borders from foreign intruders that could pose both a health menace and an ecological threat to native species. As Hi, foreigners- Jeannie, sorry, sorry to interrupt for one second. I just wanted to let you know that um, we are actually seeing your notes right now. So oh. we can um, read along and it provides another layer of captions, but I wasn't sure if you wanted that to be shared. Oh, okay. I, I moved into speaker presenter view. That's really odd. Um, yeah, I think on Zoom webinars, that function doesn't quite work as well. So I'm not sure if you are able to hmm. um, have separate notes and then maybe share your screen. It's fine for us, but I wasn't sure what your preference was. 
Okay. Here's an uh, icon. You can click there that says view slideshow, and I think it might show a different view if you can click view slideshow. But there you go. Are you still able to see your notes? Yeah, I can't see my notes, unfortunately. And that's so I thought I was going to be able to just do both at the same time. Um, that is really odd. Um, so I can't go into slideshow mode and then use the presenter view. So you can still see the notes. Yeah. That is so odd. I don't think it's a problem for the um, the participants, Jeannie, as long as you're, you feel comfortable with it. I think we're mostly just looking at your images. Okay, can you can you see the slideshow right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, let me go back to where I started. So you can't see my notes now? Correct. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, I think I found a way I was able to move through a different mode. Um, okay, where was I? Great, sorry to interrupt. Um, okay, I'll just move back to invasives in Hawaii. So plant and human regulation set the stage for the restriction of what health and agricultural officers viewed as the new contagious yellow peril, Asians in Hawaii. For American scientists and policymakers, the movement of plants, food and bodies from Asia and the insects and diseases that came with them threatened the biota that they deemed native. These trans-Pacific crossings helped fuel the emergence of biological nativism in the late 19th century. Proponents of biological nativism then sought to defend American borders from foreign intruders that could pose both a health menace and an ecological threat to native species. As foreigners gradually took over native lands, the numbers of native Hawaiians also declined. Historian and ethnic studies scholar Gary Okahiro indicates that the once dense sandalwood trees, just like native peoples, gradually diminished by the 1830s. These foreigners decimated Hawaiian populations through diseases, among other factors. So with estimates varying from 250,000 to 800,000 in 1778, the number of Hawaiians plummeted by over 50% in the 1830s. Likewise, the sandalwood trade that proved so lucrative, the Chinese called Hawaii the Sandalwood Mountains, came to an end by the 1830s. Okihiro recounts the concerns indigenous Hawaiians had about the loss of indigenous land. Naturalized foreigners, they warned, would claim the status of true Hawaiians and evict the native peoples from their land. Racialized immigrant labor and agriculture sustained these foreign implantations and cultivations. At the turn of the 20th century, Hawaii and California led the way in large scale cultivation and specialty crops. Immigration to Hawaii in particular was structured by agribusinesses that formed the foundation of its economy. Unlike California, sugar formed the basis for the Hawaiian economy and was dominated by the five big companies. The Reciprocity Treaty of 1875 and the McKinley Tariff of 1890 that protected American producers on the mainland led to the rapid increase of sugar production. Even though the Reciprocity Treaty held great importance in the sugar boom, it could not have occurred without the importation of Japanese immigrant labor. Japanese immigrants began to outnumber Chinese and Hawaiian plantation laborers, bringing with them pathogens and injurious insects. So Ellis Mills of the United States Consul General reported an epidemic of cholera in Honolulu, Hawaii that began in August of 1895. According to the special report of the Board of Health upon the cholera epidemic in the Hawaiian Islands, Chinese passengers traveling to Yokohama aboard the Belgic had transmitted Asiatic cholera. When the Belgic arrived in Honolulu on August 9, 1895, three Chinese passengers had already died en route. The special report questioned the Belgic surgeon's pronouncement that the cases were heart disease and pneumonia, arguing that they in fact died from Asiatic cholera. Another report on the epidemic expressed concerns about native Hawaiians, among whom the disease chiefly prevailed because they consumed raw seafood. 
By August of that same year, cholera appeared to have abated. Yet the president of the Board of Health, William O. Smith, noted that, that due to international commerce and the arrival of steamships from foreign ports, the danger of infectious and contagious diseases become greater. Reports indicated that these health officials focus on Japanese immigrants as sources of diseases such as Asiatic cholera and beriberi. Officials referred to cases of beriberi or thiamine deficiency as either exclusively confined to the Japanese or peculiar to the Asiatic race. The etiology of beriberi had just been discovered in the late 19th century Japan, and many American medical practitioners suspected some kind of dietary deficiency to cause beriberi. As historians Alexander Bay and Jean J. Kim have argued, debates surrounding beriberi were imperialistic in nature and possessed an element of internal colonization, whereby medical officers classified, managed, and regulated Asian bodies. Indeed, the Hawaiian Islands provided these American officers a unique colonial laboratory that included a controlled environment where they could study cholera and beriberi. The Hawaiian Islands also served as a field for not only scientific work in tropical medicine, but also for the study of botany, where plant scientists established their career and determined the biodiversity of the American empire. Okay. Can you all see that? Okay, great. Just like public health officials were agents of empire, so too were United States Department of Agriculture officials when they policed the biotic borders across the Pacific. In April of 1910, Charles Marlatt, then the chairman of the Federal Horticultural Board and the assistant chief of the Bureau of Entomology in the USDA declared the US should not admit nursery stock. If this country should set up a Chinese wall against such importation, we could take care of our own needs, growing seedlings as they were grown in the days of our fathers. By 1906, the established presence of the Japanese beetles in the Hawaiian Islands concerned the Bureau of Entomology of the Tropical Department of Agriculture so much, that they refused any soil brought over from places such as Yokohama or Shanghai. According to historian of science, Philip Pauli, the American annexation of Hawaii had disrupted the longstanding presumption that the continent's limits were the nation's borders. Yet legal precedents that spanned a century made searches of domestic travelers and their personal effects illegal. When Congress failed to act, California moved ahead unilaterally, establishing the quarantine division and prohibited the commercial shipment of almost all Hawaiian fruits. They collaborated with steamship companies to ensure that all travel between San Francisco and Hawaii had the required waiver of rights. As early as 1904, newspapers such as the Pacific Commercial Advertiser evidence how U.S. government officers carefully inspected on docks all steamers and sailing vessels entering Honolulu from, the, from outside the territory of Hawaii. They discovered a box of chestnuts from Japan infested with the larvae of a beetle and burned the entire box. Upon his death in 1908, Alexander Kral, who served as quarantine officer of California and then entomologist to the territory of Hawaii, was remembered as an economic entomologist who, uh, quote, stood like a rock at the portals of the Golden Gate against the entrance of any plants or fruits, cuttings or buds that were in the slightest degree infested with obnoxious insects or plant diseases, unquote. While the passage of the 1912 Plant Quarantine Act presumably signaled the end of the U.S.'s open door policy. In reality, bioinvasions continued to penetrate American borders. Marlatt traveled immediately to Hawaii and declared a federal quarantine in order to block the shipment of Hawaiian fruits into the U.S., knowing the U.S. and its territories remained vulnerable to attack. As a result of these early instances of biological invaders, Alexander Kral, who served first as quarantine officer of California and then the entomologist of the territory of Hawaii, drew up rigid exclusion rules regarding the importation of fruits, insects, and other animals to be sent to the governor, to, to be sent to Governor George Carter of the territory. These rigid exclusion rules attempted to preserve and protect the force of Hawaii, as well as the agricultural and horticultural interests by regulating the importation of agricultural products or foodstuffs. 
The same rules also empower the Board of Commissioners of Agriculture and Forestry to deport or destroy at the expense of whomever imported or introduced it and to prosecute the aforementioned individuals of a misdemeanor and a fine as punishable by Hawaiian law. The Board of Agriculture and Forestry extended these same rules and regulations to Asia, Australasia, Central and South America, Malaysia, Mexico, Oceania, and the West Indies. The board feared most of those biological invaders that would settle the islands and become permanent biotic citizens. Shortly after the takeover of the Hawaiian Islands, USDA officials wasted no time in securing its borders against enemy invaders that could threaten its increasingly monocultural agriculture. During Craw's tenure at the Hawaii Board of Agriculture and Forestry, an agricultural crisis caused by Japanese immigrants reached a climax. An article in the Pacific Commercial Advertiser alleges, quote, seven, several Japanese merchants are offering the first resistance to the law, protecting the territory from plant blights and insect pests, which has been encountered. They have invited a battle in the courts and their challenge has been accepted, unquote. While the article does not specify the exact type of fruit, most likely they referenced boxes of oranges, including those of K Y, or excuse me, K Yamamoto, um, which Cross subsequently burned at Iwale in December 3, 1905. Craw noted these importations of Japanese oranges infested with quote, 13 varieties of dangerous scales, blights and insects and a species of a leaf hopper, unquote. Additionally, in the approximately 113,100 oranges they discovered at least one fungus. Since the insects and fungi pose the greatest threat to vegetation and the fruit industry in Hawaii. They would be forced to either export uh, the fruit or destroy it completely in order to obviate the danger. Other unknown dangers lurked in shipments, including the oriental or the white termite. Although US government officers, particularly the Bureau of Entomology, turned to inspection and quarantine as a way to deal with immigrant pests, the oriental termite, as it was often referred, posed challenges to conventional prevention measures, since these economically significant termites often traveled across borders on wood commodities, including furniture, logs, lumber, construction materials, and so forth. Handled by a number of transportation agencies, the pest presented problems for regulation. With wood used in various products in many forms and moved by countless agencies, it would be difficult to restrict its trade. Rather, US officers recommended the inspection of wood commodities for the possible presence of termites. Yet inspection would have to be highly specialized, tailored to the specific behavior of the termite. Moreover, jurisdiction over termite control would fall to officials who deal with construction work and maintenance of buildings, not in the hands of agricultural groups who prevent the introduction of agricultural pests. US officials weighed not only the effectiveness of quarantine, but also its economic impacts on the larger economy, which included not only the agricultural economy, but also other forms of commerce. Clearly, the implementation of quarantine in this instance would prove too costly. First introduced into the Hawaiian Islands in the 1860s, perhaps as early as 1869, with the sandalwood trade with Southern China, the white termite spread across the country and emerged as the most economically important pest in Hawaii. Likely arriving in Oahu in shipments of wood, likely from Formosa or now Taiwan or South China, the white termite spread from Oahu to Hawaii in 1925, Kauai in 1929, in 1929, Lanai in 1932, and finally Molokai in 1975. Also called ground termites, the Formosan subterranean termites thrive underground where they crawl up into structures and other wood sources, including trees, and can develop wings and swarm in order to breed. These economically important pests, including C. formosanus, originated from the Orient, a mysterious place filled with riches and unseen deadly creatures. No other monster better embodied the oriental than the white termite. Um, otherwise referred to as cryptoterm Pisaetius and coptoterm formosanus, which are doing considerable damage to dwellings and other woodwork, the latter species being by far the most serious one we have had to deal with at the present time.
C. formosanus was undoubtedly introduced from the Orient, where it is the only species of this genus in Japan and the mainland of South China. A report on the termite fauna of the Philippines compared C. formosanus to the Philippine milk termite, the latter likely an indigenous species to the Philippines as it intacts wood, dead wood throughout all the islands. While American entomologists believe this milk termite responsible for over 90% of the termite damage throughout the, night, throughout the Philippines, they still deemed it less harmful than the oriental termite or the coptoterm formosanus. Not only does its common name oriental termite and scientific name coptoterm formosanus evoke orientalist colonial images, but its name emphasized the fear of the costly and deadly dangers such small creatures wrought upon its surroundings. The comparison between the foreign oriental termite and the indigenous milk termite served to emphasize the necessity of barring and combating unwanted foreigners. While difficult to fight, entomologists search for biological methods as a way to successfully battle the oriental termite. David T. Fullaway, the entomologist at the Hawaii Board of Agriculture surveyed Japan in order to find a parasite that would control the oriental termite. When he attended the 1926 Pan Pacific Science and Congress in Japan, Fullaway went to Southern Japan in search of parasites that would assist materially in exterminating the pests. Fullaway stated that in Japan, he would quote, obtain something in the nature of a fungus disease or a bacterial disease or some other low form of life or a nematoid worm, which would be introduced locally to prey upon the termites. It is quite probable that Honolulu will be in a position to get some sort of assistance from Japan in this campaign. Entomologists in Hawaii had historically introduced predatory insects and parasites in Hawaii as an experiment in their attempt to biologically control new insect immigrant pests. In the 1904 experiment station, at the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association founded an entomology, founded an entomology department to quote, biologically control sugarcane pests, unquote, including the sugarcane delphacid, del which threatened the increasingly lucrative sugarcane industry. For nearly 40 years, the HSPA spearheaded many biological control activities. Likewise, the Bureau of Entomology and the Plant Quarantine Fruit Fly Laboratories work worked on biological control on the experiment of fruit flies. Other biological control measures included the search, importation, propagation, and release of enemies of the Mediterranean fruit fly and the Oriental fruit fly um, conducted in, uh, excuse me, and the Oriental fruit fly. A wide, array, a wide array of agencies, including the USDA Tropical Fruit and Vegetable Lab Research Laboratory, the Pineapple Research Institute of Hawaii, the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association Experiment Station, the Territorial Work of Commissioners, the Territorial Board of Commissioners of Agriculture and Forestry, the California Agriculture Experiment Station, and the Hawaii Agricultural Experiment Station of the University of Hawaii's College of Trop Tropical Agriculture worked collaboratively to implement these biological control measures. Well into the 20th century, perhaps no other place conducted more biological control projects than in Hawaii due to its geop geopolitical location in the Pacific and its susceptibility to immigrant insects and other inv invaders. Hawaii proved vital to an American empire that depended on the monocultural cultivation of sugar and other economically lucrative crops. With Hawaii serving as the gateway between the US and East Asia, California moved to regulate shipments with Hawaii in the very early 20th century. More than any other region in the US, Hawaii demonstrated the need to protect the nation's borders against biological invaders that would settle the islands as permanent biotic citizens. One such invader, the oriental termite, emerged as the most costly and destructive invasive species in Hawaiian history. Monocropping, as well as industrialization, urbanization, and trans-Pacific trade all created hospitable conditions for this destructive termite. Unlike the mainland, biologists experimented with biological control projects that produced unexpected and uneven results. These white American settlers used science to control and regulate indigenous Hawaiian lands. 
In the East, unlike Hawaii, the use of pesticides abounded even as the demanded and desired Asian exotics like never before. So the discovery of the Asiatic pest occurred just as the Philadelphia region identified itself as America's garden capital. The Longwood Gardens, Jenkins Arboretum and Garden, Chanticleer, Brandywine, River Museum of Art, Mount Kiba Center, Winterthur Museum and Library, New Moore's Mansion and Gardens, Hagley Museum and Library, and Tyler Arboretum comprise more than 30 Arboretum gardens and historic landscapes within 30 miles of the Philadelphia area. Hence, the status America's garden capital. The wealthy DuPont family once owned many of these aforementioned estates, such as the Hagley Museum and Library, New Moore's Estate, Winterthur, and the Mount Cuba Center. Along with the growth of botanic gardens, arboreta, and other cultivated green spaces in the Northeast, came injurious insects and lethal pathogens, as well as corresponding use of chemicals instead of biological control. Established in 1838 on the estate of the horticulturist William Hamilton, Dreer Nursery emerged as one of the largest and most respected nurseries in the Philadelphia area. Production moved to the Riverton area as it grew in importance with its office downtown nearby Independence Hall. With their business nearly a century old, their 1919 catalog listed a wide variety of seeds and plants for sale in over 200 pages. Quote, we do not base our claims for the support of the buying public merely because we have been established for nearly a century, but rather on the fact that we are all, at all times alive to the wants of customers and that we've kept abreast of the times and in close touch with the horticultural centers of the world, unquote. Indeed, Dreer Nursery built its business on the cutting edge of plant and seed trade. By the early 20th century, before plant quarantine, Dreer sold many Japanese plant immigrants. In a, in a 1903 Dreer, Dreer Nursery catalog, the back cover showcases a vivid violet colored iris, highlighting the diversity of their plant immigrants. In the same 1903 catalog, they listed 25 varieties of Japanese iris for sale beneath a picturesque scene of their Japanese iris garden at Riverton, New Jersey. Dreer continued to sell Japanese iris for many years, prominently advertising it in a single 1913 brochure where they listed some 40 varieties for sale. However, in the Dreer garden book for 1919 that listed some daylight dolcios or the hyacinth bean ornamentals for sale, they also noted that while it comes from Japan, quote, the heart-shaped foliage is bright green and not in fact affected by insect pests, unquote. Even as plant quarantine number 37, otherwise known as PQN 37, went into effect in 1919, Dreer continued to advertise a dozen varieties of Japanese iris for sale, including Toro Odori, Yomo, Yomo no Umi, and Yoshimo, claiming, quote, improved forms of this beautiful flower have placed them in the same rank popularly as the hardy phloxes and peonies, unquote. As early as 1910s, Dreer Nursery thrived as a business where they occupied three buildings in Philadelphia and had plant and seed growing departments in Riverton, New Jersey with about 300 acres and with over 100 modern greenhouses over more than 10 acres. Hence, when the USDA passed PQN 37, East Coast nurseries, including Dreer, responded with fierce opposition. Jacob David Isley, president of Dreer Nursery, put forth some of the fiercest resistance to PQN 37. Lashing out against plant quarantine on January 9, 1919, Isley published an article along with McCutchinson and company titled, Protest Against the Horticultural Import Prohibition in the Florist Review, asking his fellow nurserymen to petition their members of Congress to block the legislation. He asked his audience, fellow florists, seedsmen, nurserymen, if they understood how, quote, radical and far-reaching this embargo is and how seriously it will affect not only every importer, but every individual in the trade who handles bulbs, plants, or cut flowers, from the largest importer down to the smallest grower, florist, or dealer, unquote. Marlet responded by publishing a rebuttal that spanned over two pages in the Florist Review on February 13, 1919. In his response, countering Dreer's barrage, 
Marlet alleged that the vociferous protest exclusively came only from Henry A. Dreer Incorporated. He countered that PQN 37 received careful consideration by the Federal Horticultural Board for a number of years, following requests from the State Department of Agriculture, State Nursery Inspectors, and government entomologists and plant pathologists, adding that, quote, similar requests have been received from the national and state forestry, horticultural and other allied associations, and from many leading nurseries and florists, unquote. He believed that a fair and open discussion had already been held at a May 28, 1918 public hearing, where even importing nursery, where even importing nurserymen and seasmen along with florists voiced their thoughts about the embargo. After a final conference on October 18, 1918, where all interested parties again voiced their criticisms and suggestions, Marlett felt that PQN 37 incorporated the best judgment of the plant experts of this department. PQN 37 attempted to prohibit the importation of all nursery stock and their plants on the ground that all such plants are sources of risk of introducing dangerous insects and plant diseases from little known countries of many, many of which do not maintain any sense, any system of inspection. The USDA decided not to restrict those classes of plants deemed essential to plant production, such as young rose stalks subject to careful inspection. Challenging the assertion by Dreher Nursery that most nurserymen and other horticultural interests oppose PQ-137, Marlet claimed that novelties, particularly bulbs brought with soil that required USDA inspection, would not be practical. Directly countering Dreher's claim that plant quarantine would hurt European allies, he argued that European countries, including France, Holland, Germany, and to a lesser extent, Belgium, have all implemented their own plant restrictions. Sorry about that. Um, Marlet's challenge to Dreher Nursery included those noxious Japanese insects that, that continue to plague American horticultural and the larger environment. He drew attention to the vast monetary losses caused by San Jose scale and even worse, the Japanese beetle which had already obtained such a firm foothold in view of its habits and powers, a prolonged flight, it is probably incapable of extermination and will no doubt ultimately overspread the United States. Without doubt, the damage already caused by the Japanese beetle was tremendous. Marlat then leveled his strongest accusation against Dreher Nursery as the origin for this particular invader. Quote, it is worthy of note that this beetle, in the opinion of the experts of this department and of the state of New Jersey, who have investigated this matter, was brought in by the Dreher Nursery with importations of iris from Japan. The insect first appeared in the heart of the Dreher Nurseries and has spread from the center over an area of approximately 25,000 acres involving four townships in New Jersey opposite Philadelphia, unquote. He sharply criticized Asiatic pests for the tremendous damage they have done to American horticulture. Quote, the annual cost to this country of the San Jose scale and the probable ultimate annual cost of these two other more recently introduced oriental pests would probably pay for the total importations since the foundation of this republic of ornamental nursery and florist stock, unquote. Marla estimated the value of imported stock for 1914 at 3,606,808, 3.606,000. With those still permitted after PQ-137, representing much of this amount. Finally, he asserted that soon nurserymen and florists will learn how to reproduce all plants prohibited in the quarantine legislation. He, along with many other officials at the USDA, feared most those Asiatic pests that would significantly damage not just American horticulture, but also horticultural industries and the larger environment. Japanese American nurseryman Toichi Demoto's oral history reveals that the inter international impact of PQ-137 on stifling trade and migration was between Japan and the US. He hints at how PQ-137 foretold a future Jap anti-Japanese legislation, such as the 1924 Immigration Act. He commented that had PQN 37 not passed, he might have had the opportunity to travel to Japan. 
quote, if it wasn't for quarantine 37, which stopped importing of plants from all over, not just Japan, but all over for propagating purposes to prevent disease and insects from coming in, I might have been inclined to go to Japan, but that stopped all chance of importing because my father's business was started mainly in importing plants from Japan, unquote. As one of the few oral histories that address plant migration and trade, the Moto highlights the larger impacts of PQN 37, including the necessity of obtaining plant permits. The Moto's father rushed to get in their last nursery stock orders before PQN 37 firmly shut the door on those suspected plant plunders in 1919, while USDA officials still permitted the private importation of a whole host of ornamentals and other plants, its complete exclusion of florist stock hurt Demoto Nurseries financially, since Demoto Brothers and other nurseries catered to a clientele who collected Asian and African exotics in particular. Demoto recalled one nursery man who requested that his father bring back as much nursery stock as he could, attesting to its high demand in the United States. Once Demoto's father brought the plants into the US, they would divide the shipment in half, with half going to Demoto Brothers, the remainder going to Cottage Gardens. The half that went to Cottage Gardens would first be shipped to Eureka, California, where Cottage Gardens had a nursery branch there. From there, part of that shipment would, would be sent to their Queens Long New Island nursery, and the azalea plants would be divided between two other nurserymen, Henry A. Dreer in Philadelphia and Bo Bink and Atkins in Rutherford, New Jersey. As DeMoto himself reveals, it was the practice of nurseries to distribute their stock all over the country, especially the Northeast. USDA plant pathologists and entomologists feared most the dispersal of nursery stock that could easily result in the silent, unchecked spread of plant diseases and harmful insects including microscopic larvae and caterpillars that could rapidly mature and reproduce in regions where no natural enemies existed. The longer history of plant migration between the US and Japan extends at least to the late 19th century during the age of plant exploration. Similar temperate climates of the East Coast and East Asia fueled systematic plant introduction. Like never before, American plant scientists spent extended periods exploring the flora and fauna of Japan. As part of its attempt to modernize by introducing Western agricultural ed education, the Meiji government in Japan hired these American plant scientists. These scientists gained access to the countryside and experienced firsthand what had been previous abstractions, the sweltering Japanese summers, which resembled American summers, both wild and cultivated plants in Japan also resemble the diversity in the United States. World fairs and international expositions also publicized and facilitated the popularity of Japanese gardens and plants by the late 19th century. At the 1894 California Midwinter International Exposition, for example, Japanese make consistently ranked as the most popular attractions. Likewise, Philadelphia served as the host for the 1876 Centennial Exhibition and the 1926 Seski Centennial International Exposition, where Japan displayed its agricultural goods. That same year, that same year, the Japanese ambassador to the United States, Tsuneo Matsudaria, formally presented 1,500 Japanese flowering trees to the city of Philadelphia in Fairmount Park to commemorate 150 years of American independence. The planting of the cherry trees in Fairmont Park exposed Philadelphians to the beauty of Japanese ornamentals and enabled nurserymen such as A.E. Woller to specialize in oriental flowering trees according to the title of his catalog. Following the passage of the 1913 Alien Land Law in California, which prohibited aliens ineligible for citizenship from owning or leasing land for more than three years, the Japanese government recognized the important role that exhibits at international ex expositions and world fairs played in facilitating Japanese American acceptance. Growing fascination with Japanese may, including tea houses, stroll gardens, sto stone pagodas, and plants continued despite anti-Asian racism during this era. Overwhelmingly, wealthy white Americans constructed the majority of prominent Japanese gardens prior to World War II, many of whom learned about these gardens 
through these fairs and expositions. And some examples of these gardens include the, the Marjorie Merriweather Post Hillwood Estate in Washington, DC, the Bernheimer Estate overlooking Hollywood, and the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. On June 18, 1928, the Evening Bulletin Philadelphia began publishing a series of nature trails that detailed walks led by George B. Kaiser, Professor of Botany at the Wagner Free Institute of Science and Carl Boyer, Director of the Wagner. These nature hikes, which uh, ran from June 18, 1928 to September 9, 1932, revealed the extent to which Philadelphians enjoy Japanese exotics in various landscapes, including historic landmarks. The third nature trail on July 2, 1928, for example, started in West Fairmont Park in front of the entrance of the Memorial Hall. The author noted that on the side of the walk, quote, has in the middle a Japanese barberry, which has red berries, which persist because their taste is objectionable to birds, unquote. In addition to the Japanese weeping rosebud cherry tree in Fairmont, Fairmont Park, other Japanese plants included Japanese buckwheat, the Japanese pagoda tree, the Japanese larch, and the sawada cypress of Japan. These Japanese plants graced private estates open to the public, the Aubrey Arboretum at Rittenhouse Square, and the Botanical Gardens of the University of Pennsylvania. Not only did these foreign exotics provide a serene and beautiful landscape for Philadelphians and vis visitors to enjoy, they also presented potential profit. In addition to plants such as bamboo, other economical plants such as rubber enticed growers. Beyond, quote, beyond to the right of a red leaf Japanese maple is a rare bush which Professor Kaiser says may be the future source of rubber. He knows about one other specimen of the species near Philadelphia. The plants were imported from Asia and are a great rarity in this country, unquote. Philadelphians welcomed Japanese plants even into the late 1920s and accepted them as a daily part of their landscape. Yet beneath this international co cosmopolitan exterior lay a southern colonial narrative about vanishing Indians. At Chestnut Hill, one nature hike included a marble statue of Chief Tediuskun, a chief of the Lenape Indians. Ironically, these nature hikes took place upon one, what was once Lenape land, cultivated and colonized to suit the international tastes of their new inhabitants. By the end of the, of the 19th century, according to the American Indian historian, Jeannie O'Brien, quote, the subtle process of seizing indigeneity in New England as their birthright involved what she called the enterprise of firsting, unquote, uh, where the term native eventually took on the meaning non-Indian. Many newspaper articles, for example, repeatedly used the phrase native chestnut or American chestnut to signify the indigenous and new world heritage they adopted for themselves. Quote, the shagbark walnut or hickory tree, like our own native chestnut, strictly an American product, is becoming extinct, unquote. Likewise, as agriculturalists and culturalists, the scientific bureaucrats who work for the USDA reappropriated native plants, making them central to nativism as the first to establish cultures and institutions that mark them as modern. White settlers controlled not only symbols of American culture, but also representations of vanishing Indians. While most of the nature hikes detailed in the evening bulletin remain silent on the issue of nativism, discussion about these trails could not altogether avoid foreign invasives that attack native lands. In an article dated August 20, 1928, a nature hike through Fairmont Park mentioned the vanishing chestnut tree just as Indians had vanished, quote, continuing up a path a number of trees studied in previous trails are passed until at a bend in the walk to the left, there's an example of the vanishing chestnut tree, the species being nearly wiped out by a blight which started in 1910, unquote. Publications issued by the USDA overwhelmingly pointed to, you, to East Asia, either the Chinese or Japanese chestnut as the source of this infection. The canker played a pivotal role in the passage of plant quarantine number 37 passed two years after the 1917 Asiatic Bard Zone, one of the most stringent measures passed because it excluded entire categories of florist stock. In another nature hike published on April 28, 1930, hikers enjoyed the beauty of Cryptomera japonica, a Japanese cedar that often grew up to 100 feet in a katsura tree desired for its yellow red bark, heart-shaped leaves and symmetry. The author then casually mentioned how, quote, 
the ginkgo is not attacked by the Japanese beetle, unquote. On the mainland, it was first detected in 1916 at a New Jersey nursery. The Japanese beetle, deemed by some to be the most obnoxious entrant after Chinese uh, chestnut blight, devoured hundreds of major vegetable and fruit, fruit crops, flowers, shade trees, and ornamental shrubs. By 1927, clouds of beetles of, Japanese variety, of the Japanese variety had settled on streets and even alighted upon pedestrians in numbers so great in the East, notably Philadelphia, that they had to pick the insects off of one another. So common was the sight of Japanese beetles on people's clothes that one newspaper writer likened it to a quote, fad from France for beetle jewelry, unquote, where pairs and artisans made insect accessories such as earrings, brooches, and necklaces. Despite the demand for foreign exotics and the accidental importation of injurious insects shifted the emphasis from biological control to chemical warfare. Foreign invasions such as chestnut blight and Japanese beetles disrupted American empire building efforts by destroying not only other ornamentals, but also lucrative agricultural crops. Even though Philadelphians successfully displayed their international and cosmopolitan tastes, it was in the Northeast that insecticides such as Japellant, Japaway, and Japex were manufactured to combat the quote unquote Jap beetle menace. Chemical warfare would have much larger implications during World War II as the US moved closer to total warfare. In this presentation, I detailed the contours of biological nativism, including the erasure of empire, establishment of biotic borders, and the control of plant, insect, and human immigrants. Examining how Asian plant, insect, and human immigrants are interwoven into US colonial sites entangled not only in the history of the US continent, but the very fabric of its environment, we can better see how racial formations across the Pacific and in the Northeast was not only about economic profit or geopolitical factors, but also the reconfiguration of, a white, of white American colonizers as natives alongside the decimation of indig indigenous ecologies and construction of Asians as a foreign menace. Both Hawaii and the Northeast serve as important regions for better understanding transnational agrarian bases of not only anti-Asianism, but also the processes of racial formations. The geographical position of Hawaii in the Pacific also makes it significant, a significant arena to reconsider how racial formations in Hawaii and across the Pacific occurred within the context of a dominant sugar plantation system and to a lesser extent, pineapple and coffee plantations just as Philadelphians sought out Japanese ornamentals and incorporated them into their daily landscapes. Bio biopolitical governance requires the erasure of not just empire, as well as the establishment of, of borders, but also a human nature dualism that denies that humans and more than humans co-constitute each other. Thank you, Jeannie, for that paper. Um, I'm seeing that some questions are starting to come in okay, um, in the Q&A function, but also I'll invite others who are still in attendance to continue to list questions that you have there. Um, but maybe just to get us started and also to allow for more time for questions to, to form in the Q&A, um, I'll pose one to you, um, which I know we've briefly talked about offline, but I wanted to kind of share in this space as well, which is um, I really appreciated this paper and the ways in which you are thinking about these multi-species forms of racial formation. And I think it's such an important project um, for Asian American studies, for environmental science, um, and for many of the ways in which our discussion of anti-Asian violence in contemporary situations um, is historicized. I'm thinking here also, along with feminist science studies folks like Banu Subramaniam, for example, right, who also thinks about kind of plant histories and mm -hmm. um, articulated as an alien species, for example. And of course, the resonances of some of those same rhetorics of infection, of the perpetual foreigner, of the alien invasion species. Um, that are being reiterated in the context of COVID-19 um, and the global spread of coronavirus. 
So I was wondering if you could maybe just comment on um, how some of the histories of both um, plant ecologies and entomology ecologies might inform some of the current kind of uh, discourses that are occurring and the racial formations that you're seeing at those intersections. Yeah, no, thank you. That's 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 such a great question. Um, you know, I was as I was writing, I, we talked about this over the phone. As I was writing, you know, um, submitting the book, the book manuscript to the press, uh, you know, there was this comment by one of the anonymous reviewers to include um, a little blurb on, you know, COVID nineteen. Um, but with the recent, you know, um, the whole, you know, what happened in Atlanta, though, all that happened, um, of course, after I submitted the entire manuscript to the press. Um, and, you know, I just, I think that a lot of my research that goes back to this idea of naming, um, why do we name, you know, it's not just, you know, why do we name, um, why do some people give COVID-19 the name of the China virus or the Wuhan virus, right? Um, but also why do we, you know, why do we then give, um, I'm just gonna think of, you know, the Japanese beetle, um, you know, the, the scientific name Popelio japonica, right? Japonica meaning of Japanese origin, anything with japonica means it's, you know, um, presumed to be of Japanese origin. Why do we, you know, what what is the science behind the naming of things? Um, and what deeper implications, um, what racial implications are there when we name something like Asian chestnut blight or the Asian San Jose scale? Um, what are the deeper racial implications of that, right? Because in my narrative, I talk about um, a bit about ecological violence, right? Um, how it's through the naming of these, these foreign species as being um, permanently foreign um, that we can then say, well, you know, not only is biological control, right? Biological control being an example of like bug on bug or parasitic, um, parasitic attempts to control invasions. Um, why is biological control insufficient? And why do we then need to turn to um, chemical warfare, right? Which is very much a part of, of you know, our modern 20, 20th and 21st century reality. Um, so why is that then suddenly become more acceptable? Which I talk a bit about in, in my conclusion of my manuscript with Rachel Carson's discussion of you know, why does that the bird stop singing? Well, part of it has to do with the Japanese beetle, which she talks about um, that it's because of this strong, um, in, in her estimation, unwarranted um, response to the Japanese beetle. Um, and I argue, you know, because Carson here is not a, a race scholar, um, but I argue that it's, it's due to the racialization um, that it's because of that, that it's able to elicit a really violent response yeah, absolutely. Right. And I, I had forgotten about that correlation in the Carson piece. So thanks for reminding me of it. And I am in, encouraged to go revisit it now through the lens that you've um, you've offered us. I think also I'm thinking here about terms like diaspora, right, even as a originally botanist term as the spreading of seeds and how that has also been taken up in ethnic studies. Um, and diaspora studies as well. And so um, it's something that I continue to think about as we talk about the politics of naming across across these different um, disciplines and genres, I think as well. Right, um, and it's not, a, you know, it's not an exact science. Um, you know, I didn't really go into origins of these species, but there, you know, I, I talk a bit about how, you know, with the Asian San Jose scale, there were questions about where did it originate from? Did it come, you know, they, they suspected it came from either Ch Japan or China, but they could never really, you know, pinpoint exactly where it was. And so there was this back and forth in, the, in their publications, in these scientific publications, where Japanese entomologists argued and debated with American entomologists about the origins of San Jose scale, right? And, you know, of course, race is understood differently in Japan versus the US, but you know, there, there were racial implications um, to these origins. It did matter. It mattered at the very least in terms of trade, right? Because you don't then want to be known as, as a place where San Jose scale then originated. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
which I think is actually a great transition to one of the first questions from our okay. attendees. Um, so I'll read it out to you here. I think it's a two part question. Um, so Mark writes, um, as a rather unnuanced response, I worry the take home message is that there should be no restrictions on imported plants and disease and that in contrast to biocontrol, pesticides should be used to control pests. I worry that we align that goals of ecosystem protection with anti-immigration sentiment, we actually allow major problems. Thus, can we distinguish these two goals without relying on racist tropes? Other countries have been fighting invasives coming the USA, sorry. Other countries have been fighting invasives coming the USA, probably as part of its neocolonial projects, maybe coming of the US, probably as part of its colonial neocolonial projects. Is there a reciprocity ways to prevent noxious pests? How noxious pests are spread? Yeah, no, that's a really that's a really great question. Um, and the way how I understand that is that you know the U.S. is one of the I don't, I don't know if it's the only nation, but I think it's one of one of a very few um, nations in the early 20th century to to really apply plant quarantine in the way how it did. Um, to really just exclude entire categories. From what I understand that Europe didn't quite do, do plant quarantine in the same way, um, where they weren't just sitting there um, excluding entire categories. Although when San Jose scale, um, when San Jose scale was discovered, um, that became a very big deal. And I know that Europe um, did respond, issued a very strong response by then implementing quarantine, um, I believe it was against the US as well as Japan. It could have been, uh, you know, Japan, East Asia. Um, but I think the way how the US has implemented quarantine um, is, way, is done in a way where there's this racialization that's gone on. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it needs to be that way. I think that it's possible to have plant exclusion um, but to be more aware. I guess that's the bottom message, the underlying message of my research is to just be aware of when you do um, consider plant quarantine. Great, thank you. Um, Wendy Chang writes, I have to go, but thanks so much for a great talk, Dr. Shinozuka. I'm a fan of your work and looking forward to reading the book. Um, so that's not that's oh, more thank a, you. a comment. <laughs> Okay, I thought there's it was a, a question. <laughs> sorry, yeah, there's just a comment there. Um, the next question is from Keely Nguyen. Keely writes, this summer we have seen the breakthrough of Asian hornet bees, but I'm not sure if there has been any more information in the Pacific Northwest. Has Dr. Shinazuka seen the racial implications of the Asian hornet bee? Yes, I, I mean, I've been trying to follow it, um, maybe not as closely as other people, but I've been trying to follow it as much as I can. And I just, I just find it really troubling that it's being ascribed as a murder hornet. Um, I posted a bit about that, about why, why is it that it's considered murderous, right? Um, it, it reminds me uh, a bit about, you know, like African killer bees, right? How they, um, how they depict, um, you know, bees from Africa uh, being very Africanized and it's being these sort of, um, you know, equally murderous um, type of bees. Um, and so again, it goes back to the naming. Why do we why do we ascribe certain characteristics to certain insects? Um, you know, it's it's to me it's it's troubling, and and I think it's it's really um, it's incorrect. It's inaccurate. Yeah, I did see some of what you had posted in response to that, and I so appreciated your reading because it was. Um, I thought immediately of you as that news came out. And so I really appreciated being able to kind of, again, apply some of these long historical frameworks to, to these contemporary events that are resurfacing in different ways. Um, let's see. A reminder again, if folks have questions, I think those are the, those are the ones that are currently there. Okay. Um, but maybe as we wait for another one, I can offer you another one that I, I'm thinking through. Let's see. Um, and this is 
a question that's still forming, but I was really interested in your discussion of the ways in which the American chestnut emerged as this sort of claim to nativism in response. Um, hold on, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing the chat now. Okay, great. Um, so this will be the last question, I think, unless there are any others from attendees. But um, I was really interested in your discussion of American chestnut and the ways that it reinscribes a certain type of nativism in the Pacific, right. um, rather in the Northeast. And um, it also, because Hawaii um, and Japan are such integral sites to your analysis, it also made me think of some of the discourse that is emerging now in Asian American studies as it relates to Asian settler colonialism as well, and its role in kind of um, discourses of nativism and also in its forms of erasure, right, of a lot of indigenous, um, not only plants and, and insects, but also um, cultures and bodies and knowledges as well. And I, I wondered if if that had come up at all in your um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, honestly, I, I I really do wish that I had spent more time in Hawaii. Um, that I, you know, the, my time in Hawaii was very short, um, and so um, it was it was rather difficult. It was rather difficult for me to find any sources um, so far, at least in terms of if I could have gotten a hold of indigenous voices in terms of things related to plant quarantine um, or debates about invasive species. Those are the types of things that I was looking for. And I, so far I have not been able to find them. This doesn't mean they're not out there, but I think it would require additional archival trips and perhaps um, an additional article publication after the book comes out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think with that, um, we will, end this version of the conversation here. But again, I wanna thank you, um, Dr. Shinozuka for sharing your book project with us. We look forward to its publication. Um, a thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. And of course, a thank you to Tamara, Rebecca, and the other um, principal investigators for EnviroLab Asia. Hope to um, continue this conversation with you in the, in the years and months to come. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everyone.